British patrol takes a wrong turn in Sierra Leone. Twelve soldiers are kidnapped by drug-crazed rebels. The hostages must do all they can to stay alive until special forces launch one of the most daring rescue missions of modern times. Worst case scenario, they shoot the hostages and then also manage to take out one of the helicopters. The attack force will need luck, skill and bravery. The raid could change an entire African nation or become a British Black Hawk Down. West Africa, Sierra Leone. Elite British soldiers burst into action 5,000 kilometers from home. Then, disaster strikes. There was a massive explosion, then the cries and the screams. They must take control. If their rescue mission fails, they will be slaughtered in this heart of darkness. Sierra Leone looks like a tropical paradise. It has fertile soil and vast mineral wealth. But in the year 2000, it is officially the world's poorest nation and the most dangerous. Life expectancy for a man is just 36. The cause is a savage civil war between the government and powerful rebel militias. 75,000 people have died over the last nine years. August 25th, a patrol of 11 Royal Irish Rangers returns to base near the capital city, Freetown. Major Alan Marshall is in command. You are right, lads? Marshall and his men are here because Sierra Leone is a former British colony and Britain is determined to stop the country descending into anarchy. Four months ago, rebels were about to seize Freetown. United Nations peacekeepers were in disarray. Britain sent a task force to defend the city, followed by 200 Royal Irish Rangers to train the Sierra Leonean army and help it defeat the rebels. Come to play, come to shoot. Lieutenant Musa Bangura is one of the best soldiers to complete the training program. Musa is the patrol's local liaison officer. He's liked and respected by the rangers, and they can't operate here without him. I used to guide them and act as interpreter the British people actually knew very little at that time about the people of this country, customs and the politics. Musa has warned the Rangers about the savage brutality of the rebels, especially their weapon of terror, amputation. They thought that if they carry out amputation, civilians will support them, they will fear them, and if they fear them, they definitely have to support them. There are thousands of victims across the country. The rebels have no political ideology. Their main aim is to seize the country's diamond mines. Every year, the mines produce gems worth up to 100 million US dollars. In rebel hands, these are blood diamonds, tainted by human suffering. But they hold another dark secret. Many rebels trade them with Al-Qaeda in exchange for weapons. Osama bin Laden's agents then sell the stones to fund global terrorism.
The patrol passes through the Okra Hills on the west side of the country. The dense jungle here is controlled by a notorious rebel group. Their headquarters is less than six kilometers away. They call themselves the West Side Boys. The 300 strong gang includes escaped criminals, women, and boys forced to arms. They love rap music and outlandish clothing. Some even wear wigs. They also have an insatiable appetite for drink and drugs. For fighters like 23-year-old Turkish, the party usually starts in the afternoon. We don't drink rum, but they get extra mind to do anything. Let me, commander, tell me. Some man then they smoke brown brown. They came me now so in a jamba no more can smoke. Their leader is 24-year-old Fode Kale. Despite the partying, he has a problem. He and many of his group are renegade soldiers. In 1997, they staged a bloody coup. But the junta collapsed a year later, and the government returned to power. The mutineers fled into the jungle and formed the West Side Boys. Now they're politically sidelined and surrounded by government and UN forces. If they leave the jungle, they could be charged with treason and war crimes. At that time, we fear. We fear that if we give the gun, we'll be arrested and sent to prison. It's a catch-22 situation, and Calais will do anything to find a way out. 1.45 p.m. The patrol stops at a UN checkpoint. What do you know about the villages up ahead here? The soldiers tell Marshall about some villages in West Side Boy territory. There's a rumor that some of the rebels are willing to risk surrender. Marshall has orders to gather intelligence on hostile forces in the area. He decides to investigate. Musa is uneasy about the change of plan. The jungle gets thicker. I said, what this area doing? is infested with West Side Boys. They will not take it lightly if they happen to see us. But there is also a personal reason for Musa's anxiety. Hold your seat, hold your seat. He knows many of the rebels are former comrades from the Sierra Leonean army. Now as mutineers, they hate him and all serving officers. They wanted all of us to support them. But because we did not do that, they taught us as traitors. The West Side boys watch as the British patrol drives into their heartland. They send a decoy team to stop the convoy. Then, an ambush party swarms from the shadows. They started shouting that if you shoot, we are going to kill you all. The rebels grab Marshall. The leader of the mob steps forward. The patrol has strayed deep into West Side Boy territory. No one here is about to surrender. Anything could happen. Musa can see the patrol is heavily outnumbered. And the rebels are well armed with AK-47 assault rifles and rocket-propelled grenades. Diplomacy is Major Marshall's only option. All right, lads. 
Lower your weapons. The rebels aren't impressed. This is a British patrol, a routine patrol. They strip weapons and valuables from the Rangers in the first two vehicles. Then they turn to the third vehicle. And there's a chilling moment of recognition. Musa served with this man before the mutiny. He knew me personally and I knew him personally. Now, the renegade soldier has a grudge to settle because Musa stayed loyal to the army. It's payback time. I thought well, they would bring a knife behind me or just shoot me like that. The rest of the patrol fear they could be next in line for the same treatment or something worse. When Musa regains consciousness, the West Side boys are taking the patrol deeper into the jungle. Late that afternoon, they arrive at the rebels' stronghold, a tiny village called Gaberi Bana. Rebel leader Fode Kale sees the 12 men as hostile intruders. I'm not the one who gives the order to arrest them, but my men arrest them and hand over them to me. So they don't have any business to go right in the jungle. I take them as a spy. He knows the British soldiers will be invaluable bargaining chips. As hostages, they'll give the West Side boys power and maybe a way out of the jungle. No! 50 kilometers away, in Freetown, senior officers from the Royal Irish Rangers enjoy a drink. An urgent message arrives. 12 men are missing. A chill runs through Lieutenant Colonel Simon Fordham, the regiment's commanding officer in Sierra Leone. We surmised that they had had an accident, or the worst case would be that somehow they had been, uh, they got involved with the West Side boys or been apprehended by them. The British commanders immediately plan a full-scale search. But Musa fears his time is already running out. I told Major Alan Marshall, this is a real messy situation. These guys might kill me any time from now. I am not important to them. I'm not going to be a bargaining chip. Maybe my days are over. Minutes later, the rebels drag him away. <laughs> He's beaten again, this time by boy soldiers. Feeling the pain, every pain, because they were beating me everywhere. My head, my eyes, my everywhere. He's thrown into an old cesspit. His cell is two meters deep and about five meters square. The stench is unbearable. There's nothing to drink. Day two, August 26th. The British begin their search for the missing patrol at dawn, but they call it off when Calais announces he is holding the patrol hostage. 
He has a list of demands. Among them, he wants an amnesty and recognition for the West Side boys, not as criminals, but as a political force. They also insist on the release of West Side commanders captured by the government. The demands weren't realistic. There was no way that they were going to be met whatsoever. These demands were a way that he was hoping that could get them out of the jungle. If they stayed in the jungle, they could see no future apart from carrying on a criminal lifestyle for which they would probably end up dead. Later that day, Calais tells his hostages he started okay. negotiations. We will negotiate, then we'll be released. He seems okay. calm and reasonable. Where is Musa? Shut up! But his volatile character emerges seconds later. Kalina, bad man. I'm a prisoner. Una can just see okay. no more. Did he get bad man? Okay. For years, he open, unexpected. Marshall realizes Calais could fly into a rage or execute the hostages. He fears negotiations are doomed. Okay. Their only hope is a military rescue. Somehow, they must smuggle information about where they're being held to the outside world. All they have is a pen and a scrap of paper. They begin drawing a map of Gaberi Bana, revealing the exact location of the hostage house and rebel defenses. The British military also thinks negotiations will fail and is preparing a massive rescue mission. It is codenamed Operation Barris and will be led by Britain's Special Air Service, or SAS. Television cameras captured their ruthless efficiency in 1980. The world watched as the SAS freed 19 hostages held by terrorists at the Iranian embassy in London. Five of the six terrorists died. There were no SAS casualties. Operation Barris will take days to organize. The hostages may not survive this long. The slightest thing could set the West Side boys off. Yeah, they were completely rational. Four days into the crisis, the rebels seem tired of negotiation. The hostages are lined up. You're going to be the first one to die. And you second. They fear executions are about to begin. And you third. Minutes pass. But nothing happens, except the arrival of palm wine. Go, 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 go. The hostages are spared simply because the West Side boys no longer have killing in mind. British officers and UN officials are still locked in negotiations tonight. The world's media reports that negotiations are underway. Unaware that in reality, the hostages' lives are on a knife edge. Day 5, August the 29th, 4.30 p.m. Lieutenant Colonel Simon Fordham, the Royal Irish Rangers commanding officer, meets the rebels at the edge of the jungle. It was a very dangerous situation. Most of them were drunk or high on drugs for the vast majority of the time. Calais brings Marshall and Captain Laverty to prove the hostages are alive. Laverty's heart is pounding. Hidden in his hand is the map of the rebel stronghold. He has one chance to pass it to Fordham. If the rebels suspect they are being tricked, they could kill all the hostages. 
He came forward, shook my hand, and as he shook my hand, there was clearly something in it. Laverty is pulled away, but no one has spotted his sleight of hand. But really, the point of these negotiations were to gain time, with a vested interest, clearly, of getting the patrol out at each and every stage. Well, they told me that, let me release the men, then they will go and meet the government and talk to them. Kelly was out of control. Uh, he ranted on with a series of demands which he would hope would get him out of the jungle. The rebel leader wants an amnesty and political recognition for the West Side boys. But then he surprises everyone. I may release some of your prisoners. He says he will release five hostages in exchange for a satellite phone. Calais wants the phone to contact the BBC, I need a satellite phone. so his demands reach a world audience. We go right to the international community, because at that time the government was so stubborn that we never listened to us. Calais departs, unaware the British have more than the imminent release of five hostages to celebrate. They now have a detailed map of Gaberi Bana. The following day, the British send Calais a satellite phone, and five rangers walk free. Their accounts of beating and mock execution strengthen the case for action. The seven remaining hostages must be freed. It was pretty clear that we were going to have to do a rescue operation as quickly as possible. While the BBC broadcasts the demands Calais makes on his new satellite phone, the SAS arrive in Freetown. For security reasons, all SAS operations are covered by an official secrets act. These are the words of a real SAS soldier. To guarantee his anonymity, they are spoken by an actor. You look forward to it. It's what you're trained for, it's what you're good at, it's what you do. If you don't enjoy it, you're in the wrong game. It's the excitement, it's the buzz. The SAS are joined by a 147-strong contingent from the Crack Parachute Regiment. The combined assault force is stationed at Waterloo Camp on the outskirts of Freetown. The SAS need detailed information about their target. They send observation teams to explore the terrain and spy on the West Side boys. They will stay near the hostages until an attack is launched. Then they will be the first into action. They soon make a crucial discovery. Hidden sandbanks block the river route to Kaberi Bana. An attack by boat is immediately ruled out. The SAS observation teams are forced to make a grueling trek through the jungle. Every step takes them deeper into West Side Boy territory. There's no turning back. Two hundred and fifty meters from Kaberi Bana, they use all their specialist training to hide, look, and listen. Powerful microphones pick up the faintest of sound waves from the rebel camp. Direct real-time observation is everything. You know everything about them, and they know nothing about you. The observation teams feed everything they see and hear back to headquarters. Captain Danny Matthews, the parachute company's second in command, attends the daily planning sessions. We were given an intelligence update, which um, which was actually quite quite an eye opener in terms of the numbers that we were dealing with potentially uh, and the types of kit and equipment that they had. They learned that about 150 West Side boys are based in Kaberi Bana, a collection of about 20 ramshackle buildings and huts. The hostages are being held near Calais' house. 
there's jungle on three sides, too thick for a large assault force to penetrate. Roquel Creek blocks the fourth side. Just reaching the village will be difficult. There's another major problem. A further 100 Westside boys are based in Magbeni, a village 2,000 meters away on the opposite side of the river. They're armed with heavy machine guns and mortars, which could lay down a deadly barrage on anyone attacking Gaberi Bana. The planners decide a two-pronged attack is necessary. The paratroopers will take out Magbeni, while the SAS rescue the hostages in Gaberi Bana. The jungle will severely hamper a British attack on Gaberi Bana. But if one comes, the West Side boys have a unique weapon. Voodoo. I know man them we then get them protection and the myself go to them. Then go was me that medicine medicine. The ritual has a profound psychological effect. Those who complete it believe they are bulletproof. Nowadays, bullets need to touch me, sir. Meager rations and constant intimidation take a heavy toll on the seven hostages. Musa's abuse is the worst. He's beaten regularly, and his dungeon is used as a latrine. My everyday slogan I remember, was to live on for another minute, another minute, another minute, hours, hours, days, days. That was what kept me going. The SAS observation teams watch and listen, but they cannot help unless an assault is launched. Their sensitive listening equipment picks up a commotion. They hear Fode Kale, the rebel leader, order Major Marshall to talk to BBC reporters via the satellite phone. He wants Marshall to tell the media the hostages are well. Marshall refuses. Take him. Calais' retribution is terrible. The hostages are led to the edge of the jungle. The SAS hear every sound as the men prepare to die. You're gonna die. Three. Two. <laughs> News of yet another mock execution sends shockwaves through the British commanders. There was a renewed focus, there was a renewed vigour. It was certainly a tangible feel that um, the amount of brutality and the way in which the hostages were being treated, there was a lot of resolve to make sure that, that, that this ended, and this ended quickly. British Prime Minister Tony Blair gives Operation Barris the go-ahead. Day 16. The rebels party. While Calais examines a stash of blood diamonds. The assault force makes final preparations. The soldiers are desperate for action and the chance to exact retribution on the West Side boys. These were horrible individuals who needed to be taught a lesson. The British know they can't reach the rebels by river or through the jungle. They must attack by helicopter. This means the rebels could hear them coming and execute the hostages. Kelly had said right at that very first meeting that any attempt to rescue the hostages would mean that they would kill the hostages outright. 
Success will depend on the speed of the attack. To save invaluable seconds, the first SAS soldiers into action will fast rope to the ground. The plan is extremely dangerous, and it ignores a key tactical lesson from history. In 1993, American special forces tried to seize rebel leaders in Somalia by fast roping into Mogadishu. The rebels shot down two Black Hawk helicopters and pinned down the assault force on the ground for 17 hours. 18 US soldiers died in the gun battle. Military analysts concluded a heavily armoured ground force should have been on standby to reinforce the airborne attack. No ground force exists for Operation Barris. Even if it did, the terrain would make it impossible to deploy. If things go wrong, the special forces will die in the jungle. Operation Barris is so risky the men give it a new and darkly ironic name. Operation Certain Death. Day 17, September the 10th, 6.16 a.m. Three Boeing CH-47 Chinook helicopters take off from Waterloo Camp. They carry all 70 SAS commandos and the first of two paratroop attack squads. You are excited, your adrenaline kicks in. It is gonna happen, you are gonna go into battle. Chinooks have a top speed of 280 kilometers per hour and can carry 45 fully equipped soldiers. They are not normally armed, but these have been rigged with machine guns. Three AH-7 Lynx attack helicopters join the Chinooks at the mouth of Roquel Creek. 60 kilometers to the east, the SAS observation teams move closer to Gaberi Bana. A night of heavy drinking has taken its toll on the West Side boys. Musa is now under guard beside Calais' house. Observation teams were predominantly given the task of preventing any interference with the hostages. The SAS stopped less than 50 meters from Major Marshall and his men. Six twenty five AM. The helicopters roar up Roquel Creek. They mask the sound of their engines by flying just above the tree line. The SAS have been split into six man fire teams, each with specific targets. The first to hit the ground has the most critical task. It must reach the hostages before the West Side boys can kill them. Six thirty five AM. Major Marshall hears the throb of distant helicopter engines. He knows instinctively that a rescue mission is underway. Three key landing zones, or LZs, have been chosen for the attack. 
A Chinook carrying 45 paratroopers swerves right to an open area 500 metres west of Macbenny. You feel quite vulnerable as an infantry soldier. You want to get off the helicopter onto the ground. You don't want the helicopter to be taken out. The two other Chinooks turn towards Gaberi Bana. The first LZ is a clearing near the hostage house. The second is a few hundred metres further north. Musa's guards hear the noise. The sounds of the helicopters keep coming. They kept coming, kept coming. Helicopters outside! They wake Fode Calais. Seconds later, mayhem erupts. The helicopters lay down a barrage of fire to knock out the rebel defences. As the Chinooks descend, the downdraft rips the roof from Calais' house. I was scared. I was scared because I knew that the beach at that time, the most came with heavy support to come and dislodge me. The command the British dread is given. Kill the hostages. The executioners are less than 30 seconds from the hostage house. But the first fire team still hasn't hit the ground. This is situation critical. If these killers aren't stopped, they will reach the hostages first, and the entire operation will be a disaster. But unknown to the rebel executioners, there is a fourth party in the drama. After more than a week in the jungle, the SAS forward observation teams break cover and open fire. They're trained to hit each target twice. Upper chest, head, boom, you're down. It's a double tap. Calais henchmen crumple in a hail of precision marksmanship. 6.40 a.m. Fire Team 1 fast ropes to the ground and explodes into action. It's a big event. It's a premiere. It happens once and you want to be part of it. It's a feeling of elation. The sprint to the hostage house takes less than 20 seconds. First, a stun grenade for the guardroom. You go up to the place and boom, it's over. It takes longer to tell you about it than it does to do it. Fire Team 1 reaches the hostages. But there's a man missing. The SAS keep the six rangers under guard. Then they begin searching for Musa. At the same time, 11 other fire teams fan out from their landing zones. Armor-piercing bullets from their M16A2s shoot straight through the flimsy mud and timber huts. They can't let the Westside boys gather their wits. A single burst of AK-47 fire could bring down one of the Chinooks. Across the river in Magbeni, the paratroopers must crush the rebels fast, or they will launch a deadly barrage of fire on the SAS, attacking Gaberi Bana. But the landing zone turns out to be a swamp. It was almost chaos when we first got off because people were under the water, people were, you know, it wasn't what was expected on the ground. I was amazed at the time that then no one drowned, to be honest. Then, the rebels open fire. The paratroopers are sitting ducks as they struggle to reach cover. In Gaberi Bana, the SAS reach Calais' house. There's no sign of the rebel leader. Something moves under the bed. Get out! Out now! It's Calais. Turkish is watching. 
I see Gooden capture Kale live. I see live within the, the dead gun. The SAS find Kale's diamonds. He fears he will now be killed. One of the, the one who captured me, like he wants to use a gunshot, then the commander stopped him, said no. Calais is taken prisoner. 6.50 a.m. While the search for Musa continues, the SAS take defensive positions. Each soldier has a carefully planned field of fire. They will defend Gaberi Bana until the hostages are airlifted to safety. Musa can hear the gun battle, but he cannot see what is happening. Musa! He's trapped beneath the wreckage of Calais Ruth. I heard his voices calling, Musa, Musa, Musa. Musa, where are you? Musa, where are you? I said, yeah, Musa is here, I'm here. I'm under the roof. After 17 days of beating, torture, and degradation, Musa is in safe hands. But, as he's carried to the evacuation point, gunfire sweeps the village. Many of the rebels have regrouped in the jungle. Now, they counterattack, spurred on by the belief that voodoo will make them bulletproof. They fought back and they fought very hard. The SAS fire teams are pinned down. A bullet from an AK-47 ricochets off a building and hits SAS trooper Brad Tinian in the lower back. The bullet exits through his chest, causing massive internal injuries. In Magbeni, there's another major setback. A rebel mortar shell hits the paratrooper's command unit. There was a massive explosion. Then you obviously hear the cries and the screams. All the senior officers are seriously wounded. There's nobody to lead the attack. The West Side boys are fighting back hard on both sides of the river. Operation Barris is turning into a nightmare. 6.55 a.m. In Gaberi Bana, SAS trooper Brad Tinian is fatally wounded. His comrades call in air support. Then, with interlocking fields of fire, they hit back with deadly effect. Across the river in Magbeni, Captain Danny Matthews realizes that with his senior officers wounded, he is now in command. The 21-year-old immediately issues orders to kickstart the attack. Your, your role, your responsibility kick in, your training then kicks in. Predominantly, I just wanted to make sure that we didn't lose momentum. As we eventually sort of broke in, there was a massive amount of fire. I get a lot of it very inaccurate, to be honest. The West Side boys crumble as more than 100 paratroopers sweep through Magbeni. They were bewildered by the sheer speed and, and the aggression and the, the numbers that, that would sort of overwhelm them with so early on and so quickly. 7 a.m., half an hour after the attack started, a Chinook makes a high-speed approach to Gaberi Bana. Sporadic fire is still coming from the jungle. The seven traumatized hostages break for freedom. A lot of emotion was going through me. You know, the feeling of being safe, the feeling of being alive, the feeling of, oh, well, I have not been killed, I am not dead. And because I never knew I was going to see my parents again. I never knew I was going to see my family, my friends, all those people I used to know. Seconds later, the hostages are airborne. Their ordeal is over. The British crush the last pockets of West Side Boy resistance over the next three hours. The entire attack force is gone, 
by 10.30 a.m. British Prime Minister Tony Blair declares Operation Barris a success. And I cannot pay high enough tribute to the skill, the professionalism and above all the courage of the armed forces involved. SAS trooper Brad Tinian is the only British fatality. The West Side boys pay a much heavier price. The official rebel death toll is 26. But blood trails suggest the real body count is much higher. The remaining West Side boys either surrender or melt into the jungle. Their leader, Fode Kale, is imprisoned. To this day, he denies full responsibility for the crisis. I'm not the one who created the problem. God knew. Because if I'm the one who created the problem, obviously I, I'm supposed to die on that particular day. But so God, so God saved me from that. The destruction of the West Side Boys shocks other rebel groups in Sierra Leone. They fear they could be next and begin to surrender. Within months, the civil war is over. Musa still bears the scars from his ordeal. But when he revisits Kaberi Bana, he knows it was worthwhile. Because one wrong turn triggered a sequence of events that changed the course of history. Whatever peace they are, they are enjoying today, I, myself, and those British guys that were held hostage, we are responsible. Sierra Leone is still a poor country. But now, its people have the chance to prosper. <laughs>